Welcome everyone to InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Today is February 20th, 2012. Today's guest, we're going to have in studio Aaron Dykes, who's coming back just from Dallas. Uh, he came back earlier this afternoon. We sat down to talk with him about Alex's speech and the big groundswell support that is happening, not just to people who are fans of Alex Jones, but people who love freedom and who are sick and tired of this country being taken over by international bankers. And, uh, but first, the news. We've got the McPetrie. That's on the menu today. Test two burgers. And this is out of natural news. Artificial hamburger meat successfully grown in vat of bovine fetal cells. You want some fries with that? Well, I'll just to let you know, I used to work at McDonald's and uh, I saw kind of what that was like there. And I can't even imagine wanting to eat um, any type of meat process or product that is grown in a Petri dish. Here we go to the quote. The test tube meat strips actually pulsate and twitch during their laboratory growth phase, by the way, and they're ultimately ground up with strips of test tube fat grown in a similar way to produce a fatty hamburger-like substance. This has been accomplished by Professor Mark Post of Maastricht University in the Netherlands, who announced his team's results of the American Academy for Advancement of Science yesterday. So he's saying test two meat's going to save the world so we can grow all this stuff. We can put our vaccines in it. We can put the kind of uh, stuff, you know, the sweeteners in it that, that are poisoning you. You know, that's all good for you. So we're going to do that. And uh, yeah, I, do, I will not be eating any type of test tube meat. And uh, <laughs> I, I like the end of this article. It says, no doubt test tube hamburger, hamburger makers will tout their meat as being cruelty free by saying no animals were killed in harvesting this meat. Maybe not, but how many humans will be killed in the consumption of it? I agree. I will not be partaking in the barbecue cookouts with test tube burgers. Moving on, government resurrects plan to monitor all phone calls and emails. This is from Steve Watson, writing for us out of England. And MI5, MI6, and GCHQ want official real-time access to all communications. And no, they're not going to pay for it, which should, in effect, being everyone else pay for it. They want the private companies themselves to be the police. And this is reported out of the Telegraph. Following the outcry over the announcement, the government suggested that it was scaling down plans when then Homeland Secretary Jackie Smith stated there was absolutely no plans for a single central store of communications data. However, as the climb down was celebrated by civil liberties advocates and the plan was replaced by new laws requiring ISPs to store details of emails and internet telephony for just 12 months. Fresh details emerge indicating that the government was implementing a Big Brother spy system that far outstrips the original public announcement. So there it is. They want the private companies to pay for it, which in turn is going to pass the cost on to you. And then you're going to have all this type of trouble with hackers getting in and wanting this information. And it's just another crazy bureaucracy that Big Brother is going to institute. And don't worry, this is going to come to the U.S. as well. And in fact, it, maybe it already has. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that Google's iPhone tracking, web giants, others bypassed Apple's browser settings for guarding privacy. The Google code was spotted by a Stanford re researcher, Jonathan Mayer, and independently confirmed by a technical advisor to the journal, who found that the ads on 22 of the top 100 websites installed the Google tracking code on a test computer, and their ads on 23 sites installed it on an iPhone browser. So basically what they were doing was using this code, and it was to trick the software into letting them kind of go through the back door and monitor what the users you know, look at, who they talk to, what they see. And uh, Google's privacy practices are under intense scrutiny. Last year, as part of a far-reaching legal settlement with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, the company pledged not to misrepresent its privacy practices to consumers. The fine for violating the agreement is 16000 per violation per day. The FTC declined to comment on these findings. And an Apple official also said, we're working to put a stop to the circumvention of the privacy settings, which... I don't know if I trust Apple any more than I trust Google at this point. They're all giant companies, and they all want that data, and they're all using it uh, in ways that you think, oh, this is a free service, this is something free, but basically they're taking your data and going to do what they want with it. Moving on, Paul Craig Roberts submitted an article for us today 
silencing the critics. And this goes into, um, he's talking about how uh, basically the major media has got rid of the, the last two members who were not for the uh, Washington Tel Aviv imperialism. And uh, Freedom Watch was canceled by Fox TV and Pat Buchanan was fired by MSNBC. Both pundits had wide followings and were appreciated for speaking frankly. What if the heart of the government policy remains the same no matter who's in the White House? What if the heart of government policy remains the same no matter what the people want? What if those vaunted differences between Democrat and Republican were actually just minor disagreements? What if both parties just want power and are willing to have young people fight meaningless wars in order to enhance that power? My view is there is no hard, solid evidence the Iranians are anywhere near an atomic bomb. And if they aren't, keep negotiating with these people and don't start down the road to a third war in that part of the world when this country cannot afford the two wars it's already fighting. And Paul says, the idea that the U.S. is a democracy when it most definitely does not have a free watchdog press is laughable. But the media is not laughing. It is lying, just like the government. Every time the U.S. mainstream media opens its mouth or writes one word, it is lying. Indeed, its corporate masters pay its employees to tell lies. That is their job. Tell the truth and your history like Buchanan or Napolitano or Helen Thomas. You remember her uh, just a couple years ago, might have been a year and a half ago, that she stood up and said something that wasn't uber pro-Israel. And the next thing you know, she's being fired. And she was a stalwart there at the press corps at the White House for many years. So... Where does that lead us? That leads us to citizen media and citizens taking action, okay? And what we have here with the underwear bomber, what do we have? We had Kurt Haskell standing up, just one man, and saying, hey, the official story that they're giving us is a bunch of BS. I just got back from Detroit. They're interviewing Kurt Haskell for two hours. And let me tell you, the man knows what he's talking about. He knows this whole thing is, is a fake and a farce. And... Just to prove it, you know, you can tell after our show must have had an effect on some people. C-SPAN um, has a program called Washington Journal. And it was this morning that Mickey McCarter was on. And he writes for uh, a, a blog, I think it's called Homeland Security Today, which definitely sounds like a government mouthpiece organization. And Mickey McCarter is this correspondent journalist with all these decades of, of reporting on military matters. So he's a guy we can trust, right? We have these C-SPAN clips, and as, you know, the C-SPAN people wanted to talk about the $36 billion cut in the Federal Air Marshal Service and asking if that was going to make a difference. Well, for one thing, Air Marshals arrest about four people a year, and none of them have ever been terrorists. They've been drunk guys or, or people who probably don't like getting felt up and don't like being cramped in small chairs and whatnot, and so they have an outburst. Well, there's an Air Marshal. Unfortunately, we've never had air marshals where there were terrorist attacks. So anyway, um, the parts I want to show you from this program is about 30 minutes. You can find that on C-SPAN, uh, their website. The first one is a caller, Robert in Austin, who was calling on the independent line. And here's what he had to say. He wasn't interested in, in talking about this budget cut for air marshals. He was more interested in talking about the underwear bomber. Robert, independent caller in Austin, Texas. Good morning. It's amazing how much... Uh different information on this this underwear bomber there is this guy never had a visa the gentleman was let on the plane literally forced they, they tried to keep him off the plane and two attorneys who have just submitted you can go look on YouTube said that <clears throat> he was let on the plane forcibly he was denied access to that airplane two or three times in some unnamed office in this in the US government and you should look this up sir they, they let him on that plane forcibly. He was not allowed to be on that plane, and somebody put him on that plane. Now, why would a CIA agent, the, the unnamed agency, want to get that guy on the plane? Oh. I'm not familiar with the story of uh, anybody this attempting guy has to stop no him. Idea. Um, my understanding is that the, uh, the PETN that yeah. the underwear bomber was go carrying into the typical uh, was, was uh, government response. Let's get rid of him. Get rid of him. We'll come back to him later, Mickey McCarter. He's not familiar with any of these stories. He's an investigative journalist, but he's not familiar with any of this stuff written about the underwear bomber, most of which came out from the websites M Live and Detroit Free Press, who are actually publishing part of the truth for a while. Um, although I went back today to try to find some of the articles um, Kurt Haskell was pointing me to, 
and a couple of them have been removed. And the one in particular is where uh, Undersecretary Patrick Kennedy is saying, hey, we let the guy on the plane because we wanted to see who he was working with. So why don't you check the security cameras in Amsterdam, see who he was working with? You know, some Kurt Haskell who wanted to testify said, hey, I saw a sharp dressed man get this guy on the plane, that he didn't have a passport. And so they let him down a hall. They said, go ahead, you have to go down and talk to some other people. That's what happened. At least that's what Kurt Haskell said. And he said he's got another witness that confirmed it, but they're afraid to come out and talk. So we got Haskell. He's the only one at this point. Next, we have Devin in New Hampshire, who must also be a listener and doesn't like seeing this garbage spewed on C-SPAN. Here's what he had to say. In Derry, New Hampshire. Good morning, Devin. Good morning. Hi there. Uh, I heard your guest mention the underwear bomber a little while mm -hmm. ago. And uh, I just wanted to mention attorney Kurt Haskell's uh, testimony at the Mutalib trial last week. He was a witness to the event, and his blank he stare. Says that he has no thought. Mutalib didn't have a passport and wasn't going to be allowed onto that plane, except he was escorted by two men, two men in suits, who claimed national security in order to get him onto the plane. And uh, Kurt Haskell, in his in his this testimony, guy buy it. said all this. He wasn't he didn't allowed get it to actually be from a Homeland Security the trial because they got him to plead guilty. But I just feel that the real terrorist that we should be afraid of is our federal government. And the TSA sticking their hands down our pants isn't going to make things better. It might be. Oh, then oh they cut him off. I appreciate that last uh, comment. But yeah. Devin's bringing up this question that one of our earlier callers mentioned of um, an idea that, that an idea. Mutalib was somehow forced to go on the plane or was escorted by agents of some kind. Okay, yeah, there we go. He had no idea. He's never heard anything like that. It's so funny to hear this guy talk and the way they try to spin it, what he's talking about. You know, here we have somebody who's obviously a listener of the show because Alex says, hands down your pants at least three or four times a show. Um, he's out there at least talking what, what the rest of America is talking about. They don't like being felt up by the TSA. And the reason we have the TSA feeling people up is because of this case. This case is crucial since 9-11, this has been one of the biggest non-terror threats to come across that's been used to, you know, increase our security in the form of safety, in the name of safety. And, uh, you know, obviously he hasn't heard and he, he doesn't want to know about it. At, at this last caller, Mark, it was from Michigan, he, um, he gets on, says the same thing, tells the guy he can't believe he doesn't know any of this. And then finally, it seems like Mickey's going to wake up and he's like, well, I'm going to do a little investigating. So here's the call right here. Wayne, Michigan, on our independent line. Good morning, Mark. Uh, yes, I have a question about you claiming that you had no idea about that uh, underwear bomber being helped onto that plane. I live on disability, and I even knew about that. If you've seen the evidence that I have gathered about this individual and about the warehouses that were completely filled with all of these body scanners and no airports were buying them so then this underwear bomber thing came along and every one of them got sold immediately this is how they work these elites that have hijacked the federal government are using it by use the use of the media by lying to the people so mark so mark you're saying that there's an infrastructure in place that's geared towards making money off these crises. so mark is claiming that it's saying a, you're a, a liar lady and the rest of you the rest of you mouthpieces uh, funded by government are liars. I don't even need to hear. Well, you know what? Let's hear him. Talking what to is my he colleague, Tony Kimmery, who specializes in intelligence to see if he is aware of, you know, uh, the stories that somebody might have helped the underwear bomber onto this yeah. plane, uh, mm -hmm. because I, I certainly am unaware of them. Bill, totally Republican unaware. in Fairfield, Connecticut, our last call. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I hate to keep hammering you with this underwear thing, but yes, there's been a lot of news about this. In fact, it was televised on C-SPAN before Congress. Under Secretary of State for Management, Patrick Kennedy said that um, the gentleman was allowed to get on the airplane uh, because they were tracking him, which is troubling in either case, knowing that he had a bomb oh, on him. Okay. And, and I can't take any more. The smug-looking dude. Hmm, let me have some of my cup of joe here while I totally dismiss whatever you're saying because uh, it didn't come to me from a, 
a file labeled from the Homeland Security because that's what I am. I'm a mouthpiece. I, I only say what they tell me to say. And that was definitely Patrick Kennedy. I've never heard of him. I know he works for the government. Don't know who he is. I don't know who Kurt Haskell is. You know, he's the only the most prolific person outspoken about the underwear bomber case. And if you type in underwear bomber, you're invariably going to see a picture of Kurt Haskell on the Alex Jones show telling him that he saw a guy get him on the plane. I mean, it's, it's great, though. I love to see the callers not taking this. They're not sitting down. They're not just letting the news be fed to them. They are culture jamming, and that's what we all need to do. You know, and as the dinosaur media dies, this will become less and less important. It will become more important to form communities of people you know who you're going to trade with when the economic collapse happens. But... Right now, I love seeing this, um, you know, the underwear bomber, sorry, bud, you were a government patsy, or as, or as he said, I'm not the government patty, which I, I don't know where he gets that from. But anyway, we'll move on. Oh, but before we do, I am going to take the uh, Kurt Haskell interview, chop it up into four parts, and you're going to see him the rest of the week. We're going to have, uh, you know, at least 15 minutes of Kurt Haskell each show talking about how this was a government operation. And it was made, well, at least in his opinion, in my opinion, too, because let me tell you, right after the underwear bomber happened, the next day and the day after, all it was was, we got to put in body scanners. We got to put in body scanners. How are we going to fight this? And they would turn to the expert who was Michael Chertoff, who used to be the head of Homeland Security and now owns a body scanner firm. Or actually, he owns a firm that consults for body scanner companies. So he's out there trying to get body scanners sold. That's where his interests lie. His interests really don't lie in safety. So anyway, I, I sent Mickey McCarter an email myself with some links, one of which was to uh, Police Save for the Rise of FEMA and some other news articles detailing all the stuff these callers were telling him, just so we know they, they weren't making stuff up. This has been stuff in printed media. And he probably won't look at it. He probably won't respond to me. I invited him on the show. We'll see. We'll see if he accepts it. He probably won't because that's not who's paying his bills. The people aren't. He's getting, I'm sure the government in some ways is, uh, is funding Homeland Security today. Uh, anyway, moving on to oil. That's right. It's the oil, stupid. Iran stops oil sales to British and French firms. This is out of Reuters. Iran has stopped selling crude to British and French companies, the oil ministry said on Sunday, and a retaliatory measure against fresh EU sanctions on the Islamic State's lifeblood, oil. See, the problem with Iran is they don't have enough refineries to make gas, so they have to ship a lot of crude out to get gasoline in, and those sanctions are being imposed on them by the EU, basically to kind of corner them into uh, striking back. And so what they're doing is they're stopping sales of oil, which is... You know, that's what I would do if I was being cornered and I had a lot of oil. So Iran was supplying more than 700,000 barrels a day to the EU plus Turkey in 2011. And uh, it's definitely going to drive up the price of oil, of course. The Independent reports oil prices at a nine-month high after Iran dispute. Iran's oil ministry said it stopped shipments to British and French companies and a preemptive blow against the European Union after the bloc imposed sanctions. They included a freeze on the country's central bank assets and oil embargo set to begin in July. Also, we have Saudi Arabia getting in on the game. Saudi Arabia cuts oil output export industry report. The world's top oil exporter, Saudi Arabia, appears to have cut both its oil production and export in December, according to the latest update by the Joint Organizations Data Initiative, or JODI an official source of oil production, consumption, and export data. So I don't know if they're siding with Iran in this or if they're just trying to hedge their bets. Or I think they want to drive up, my personal opinion is that they want to drive up the price of oil that would drive up the price of gas. And maybe it will make these stupid Americans see that war with Iran is not prudent. And uh, Business Insider you don't believe me? Believe them. Gas prices are getting close to the magical freakout point, and they point to $4 uh, a gallon being that magical freakout point, which we had back in uh, late 2008 as the Bush administration was leaving and uh, oil companies were getting their last gasp out of us in that year. And um, we have a chart here from AAA. It shows what the current 
average gas price is, it's 356. And one year ago at this time, it was 316. So we are about, uh, well, let's see, 55 cents from our, regu our, our highest recorded average price, which was in July of 2008, 411 a gallon. And that was just average. You can go to California right now and pay almost five dollars a gallon of gas. They're 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 always hit first. They seem to have I guess they the eighth largest economy, so they can pay for it. And uh, then you have places like Texas and other refinery locations. Louisiana usually pay a little bit less um, than that, but it's coming, folks. Get ready for higher gas prices, and they're only going to go up higher as we continue this fight with Iran. But most of the people out there won't care. They'll be cheering and watching the, uh, the remote control uh, Sega Genesis bombs hitting their targets. <clears throat> Finally, before we leave, we have a little bit of science news. Transistor made using a single atom may help beat Moore's Law. Just to let you know, Moore's Law states that the number of transistors that can be placed on an integrated circuit doubles every 18 months to two years and it's predicted to reach its limit with existing technology in 2020. Cutting the size of a transistor to a single atom may defeat that concept. And before um, I was doing the other media jobs I was doing back in the early 2000s, I worked in a semiconductor company. They were uh, a manufacturer of these machines that they would sell to larger companies like uh, AMD or Intel or advanced micro devices, a lot of different companies. And I remember they went from the 200 millimeter size of uh, wafer, which they would put micro, they would lay microchips on. It was kind of like photolithography. They would lay down different materials and take them off and lay down more. And that's how they created these circuits. Well, then they made the jump to 300 millimeter. So they uh, increased their size um, by more than 30%. So you're able to get more chips on each wafer. It was pretty amazing going from 200 millimeter to 300 millimeter and upgrading these companies, you know, from the, the small pan pizza to the medium sized pan pizza. And <clears throat> so each wafer would be, you know, worth about, you know, 20 to $30,000. Um, and I remember they were talking about just one, uh, this shelf, uh, it was this legend, I guess, in AMD that um, one of these shelves was about to fall over with a bunch of wafers and the guy saved it. And he got like a $10,000 bonus. That's how much money he saved. So there's some pictures of the wafers right there. And those, those are the 300 millimeter size that they went to. So if you look at the 200 millimeter, it was a lot smaller. And that was earlier in this decade. And then they cut them up. And those chips then go into your cameras. They go into your game consoles. They go into your phones. They go into basically everything that we use today. So making one the size of an atom is pretty extraordinary. The only catch is they had to keep they have to keep the temperature at minus 391 degrees fahrenheit to keep the atom from migrating out of its channel so i don't see those being put into practice anytime soon but it's sort of a proof of concept hey we can build the smallest uh transistor in the world and here it is it's an atom so coming up next it's going to be little nano machines that aren't aren't very big you know probably be put into a uh a, a vaccination syringe and Decked it into you. Make sure you're getting your meds. Well, that's the news. We're going to go to break. And, um, oh, let's do the quote of the day first, right? And then we're going to go to break. And this is from William Ralph Ng. And he writes, It is astonishing with how little wisdom mankind can be governed when that little wisdom is its own. And that was William Ralph Ng. And uh, big thanks to John Bound who puts those quotes together. He's going to be doing a man on the street this week. We've got a great week of shows, even though Alex is going to be out. Um, he's traveling to Florida now and on Sunday, he will be at the Jayalai theater in Orlando. So if you haven't got your tickets, I think they still have some seats left. You can go to infowars.com forward slash events and check that out. During the break, I've got a little video that I prepared for you guys. Last week I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and I had to meet with the city of Pittsburgh lawyers, I filed suit against them um, the day before the statute of limitations uh, ran out. And I filed suit against them for false, for basically false arrest and a detainment for over 12 hours, part of which was spent out in the courtyard in pretty cold weather. I would say it was upper 40s, lower 50s, and it was drizzling. And all I had on was shorts and a t-shirt because I'd been running around the whole day 
um, shooting protest footage for uh, the G20 or people protesting the G20. Uh, the police arrested me. I've got video footage all the way up to the arrest. I showed a little bit of that in there. And basically, I went back to the spot where I was arrested and have a little commentary. And this was after we went through the negotiation phase. So enjoy that. And when we come back, we're going to be sitting down with Aaron Dykes talking of a whole host of issues. It's InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm your host, Rob Dew. Yeah, I'm signing these evil 1776 flags. Doesn't get any more out of control than that, ladies and gentlemen. It's pretty un-American what we're doing here at InfoWars.com. I mean, not only are we promoting liberty, but we're selling 1776 flags. Now that is Al-Qaeda. Hey, this is Rob Dew. I'm uh, standing at the spot where uh, I was arrested a little over two years ago during the G20, arrested for being a journalist. I yeah, for your safety, get down on the ground. Can I get out of press? I for your safety, get down. Right. You're with the press? Yes, sir. Who are you with? We just got out of a mediation that was done, which I believe was done in bad faith by the defense. And um, I can't really talk about much that went on, except there no settlement was reached. Um, and it looks like we're going forward and, and going to keep on doing some investigating and digging and, and uh, see if we can move forward with trial. But I do want to say this. When people see a lawsuit settlement and they think their taxes are going to go up and whatnot, that's not the case. Um, Cities purchase um, insurance when they have these events to cover against these losses. So there's already a company backing this. And one of the companies involved in, in this particular settlement with the city is, is either AIG or a subsidiary of AIG. I, I think their negotiations were in, in bad faith, and uh, so we're moving forward. But... Um, before we go, I just wanted to show you, this is, so that's the spot where, about where I got arrested. Um, if you've seen Police State 4, there's cops lining up all around us over here. And before that, I was over in this area, Heinz Chapel, and that's where they, uh, there's a spot, I guess in the intro, you could see where there, there's a cop that points a gun at a couple of girls to, uh, scare them off and whatnot. And if you look all around, there's, you know, there's a hill down there. There was a protest going on over across the street, which is initially why the cops were called out. And about 1,500 riot police showed up, probably more, and sequestered that protest, which was against police brutality. And then they decided, since so many people had come out to see what's going on, so many college students, they decided it was time to practice their kettling tactics on them. This is my opinion, of course. Um, but you can hear it. You can hear it in Police Day 4, where we... Uh, put some of the uh, radar or uh, the uh, scanner, police scanner uh, audio on how they're talking about how they're going to attempt to cir encirclement and move on up the street and they're going to push down and they actually staged over here on this street as they were pushing people up this way so they were pushing them this way and they already had cops on the back end ready to entrap people and this is after they told them to leave and I have on video um, of a, uh, a female journalist who was allowed to leave right before I was arrested. And um, she showed her pass. They let her through. I walked up, tried to show my pass. And the first officer that I talked to initially said, yeah, you can go, but you have to, you know, you can get out of here, but you have to leave. And I told him I would leave and would not stay. I have to, let's, let's just put the camera on. 
Sir, you understand you have to leave. Do not yes, come sir. back, you're going to be arrested. You All understand right. that? Yes, sir. Okay. And then a, uh, a, f a female officer came out and said, no, no, he's, he's not with the press. And, um... No. Not press. No. Not press? No. I'm... No. Yes. I'm not sure why she made that determination, but she did. And so I ended up spending over 12 hours in uh, being detained of my rights of, of free movement. Um, I was put in handcuffs. I was taken to another location during this time. I tried to talk to the officers to get them to just show them my press pass that I was indeed press, I was being paid, I was on assignment. Um, you know, it's a little different than a citizen journalist, but you know, uh, that there was no reason that I should have been detained. And as a result of being detained, um, you know, I've it, it's one of the things that that really changed my outlook on the system and and police in general and their tactics. There was, uh, you know, no talking with these people and they were all just doing their job, as they said, you know, just doing their job, pushing college students around and, and uh, terrorizing people. So anyway, this is, uh, I think these are the grounds of the Cathedral of Learning, which is behind me over here. That's the Cathedral of Learning. This is Heinz Chapel and, um, you know, there's not much to say. I guess I'm going back home. It was kind of a, I feel like it was pretty much a, a wasted trip. And, uh, but I, let, me, let me reiterate that people who think that, that their property taxes or that their uh, sales taxes are going to go up as a result of these lawsuits, that's not how it is. These, these things are paid for by insurance companies already, and um, they, they take out these insurance policies. And... Those are the people holding the money, and incidentally, these are the companies that we also bail out with our tax money. So maybe in effect you could say it is your tax money, but it, it was already paid for when, when the government decided to bail these companies out, one of which was AIG. Uh, so that's about it. That's about all I have to say. It was pretty interesting coming back here and seeing this place in the daylight. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Let's see. Way in the background over here, right along the fence line, there's these hedgerows that they had fences in, and they're pushing people into them. Um, I have on video of them knocking this guy who was dressed up in zombie makeup. He came out to be a zombie protester, much like our zombie population who allows this stuff to happen. And they don't, they don't do much. They don't speak out. And this is why we're in the position we're in now. And it's not going to change unless people wake up wake other people up and start to talk about this stuff because this needs to be the vernacular this needs to be what we're talking about why why are we supposedly the greatest country in the world and yet we're treated like prisoners in our own country why do we allow ourselves to get felt up in the airports why do we allow them to use body scanners on us um, why do we allow them to create a prison industry that is operated uh, for profit by private companies, which then you, leads to people being arrested and lots of laws being created to arrest people. Why do we have that? Those are the questions we're really going to need to face in the next few years in addition to our uh, collapsing economy because it's, uh, it's coming and the indicators are there and we just have to ask ourselves, is that the kind of country we want to live in? Do we want to be a third world country where we're lowering our standard of living to beg other countries to come here and be tourists because that's what's coming so uh, thanks for watching and um, I'll keep everybody informed as much as I can there's some things I can't say some things I can't say but uh, anyway that's about it I'll see you later greetings fellow info warriors Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in.
And we get so busy here at Infowars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at Infowars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at Infowars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. All right, we're back. This is Rob Doon. You're watching InfoWars Nightly News. And over here to my right is my good friend Aaron Dykes. He's fresh back from Dallas and here to talk about a host of issues, including uh, the speech that Alex gave last night. How's it going, Aaron? Uh, pretty well. We just got back just a few hours ago. So Yeah. So, so tell me, how was the speech? A lot of people, there's a lot of comments out there. People seem really psyched about it. I saw some Yeah, photos. the crowd's energetic. I mean, of course, Alex is reaching millions every day on the web and everything anyway and through the radio, but there's really something about the energy of a crowd with a packed house. It was totally sold out uh, in a theater, an old classic theater that seats 800. Great crowd. Everybody there was very well informed. All wanted to talk about the issues, and Alex, very passionate, of course. Great speaker. Yeah, and you got to introduce uh, Jim Mars. Yeah, I just did a quick introduction. They invited out Jim Mars because he lives in the Dallas area, and you know he's been in our circles for years, and and he really appealed to the crowd as well. And it's really reached the point though where everything Alex and Jim Mars and everyone else has been warning about for decades is right in front of our face. It's not that period of denial of is there going to be a police state or are they trying to control us or or is the whole system corrupt and falling right. on its face? It's yeah. rotting right now oh, as yeah. they seek greater control. That's evident to everyone. And so Alex was really trying to focus on how do we bring this thing uh, into a new era, you know, how do we, how do we solve these problems and, and kind of reclaim our nation, our world, everything. So it was like a giant solution segment. In a large way, yeah. We aired the special film we've been working on, right. and we're going to air it again, of course, in Orlando this Sunday. Right. 40-minute uh, film, really, uh, we titled it New World Order. Uh, not Diary of a Madman, but uh, the blueprint of the Mad Men, really just highlighting how crazy they are, mm -hmm. how much control they've taken over our lives, and the dangerous experimentation uh, they've done, risking literally the whole planet, all our lives, you know, willing to sacrifice soldiers, test subjects, yeah. living human beings, everything. And But it's just apparent to everyone who's been following this issue now, people who are still waking up, waking up for the first time, uh, it's very easy to see. I mean, the TSA is right in your face. All of it is. Right. And it starts off with Alex kind of doing his dark parody uh, in the coffee house and moves on, or how, do, how does it go? I didn't see the whole thing yet. Yeah, it starts with the, the parody that's been online already, and then mm -hmm. it moves into just covering all the issues, kind of similar material to what's an endgame, but, but updated with new stuff. The Gates Foundation, of course, yeah, yeah. has become even more important than the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, we really pointed out a lot of lies and how they've invested themselves in lying in the system, how they've given power to these lies and, and cowards out there, and people in the dark uh, accept those lies and give them even more power. So we're trying to shed a light on that. And Alex really makes the case it's time for that house of cards, that mm -hmm. house of illusion that they propped up. That has to fall one way or another. Yeah, Bill, if it rots slowly, it's going to hurt a lot more. Right, Same right. Same stuff Ron Paul's talked about. Totally. And uh, Bill Gates seem, seems to have taken the active upper management role in, in making this, you know, especially the depopulation agenda. Maybe not so much in, in the world banking, but depopulation seems to be his main focus. And um, especially when, when you look at, uh, what was it, a couple of years ago, we found out how he was putting most of his new investment into, um, into the gut into the immune system. That's where most of your immune system lies and how to affect that and 
and things you can do to that. So that's just, that doesn't spell anything good for us at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's all on the on the wings of giving and how charitable right. and nice he is. But what he's using his research dollars for is vaccine technology, research into how vaccines affect the gut immunity, mm -hmm. uh, all the all the gut floor and the things that happen inside the body. They're studying that specifically, as well as things like how to destroy sperm uh, covertly or, or through vaccine technology and a lot of other really creepy stuff just designed to take over our lives at the individual level right. as they're consolidating us at the global level. Totally. And speaking of creepy, the, uh, the McPetrie that uh, I was looking, I was looking at that article, we covered it earlier. And I mean, that is just, you know, okay, it's great that we can grow meat in a test tube, but would you eat that? I mean, absolutely not. Uh, and it's creepy because, you know, at the same time, they're blint, blurring the lines on organic food and GMO right. food, and it's getting harder to find organic food, even as people are finding out because of the deceptive labeling, calling mm -hmm. things natural, when that yeah. doesn't mean that it's non-GMO. Natural doesn't mean anything. But this article is really almost at the soil and green level. It is. You know, of course, where they use people for the food, and, and we're all supposed to eat it, and yeah. It's just such a sick system. There's so much that science and technology could do, but the way the research dollars flow through these foundations, it used to be the Rockefeller Foundation, the most important one. Yeah. They control the research and steer it towards their own designs. So, of course, all this great technology is used only for control, and almost people, exclusively. People don't see that because they don't you know, come up with a grant that says, hey, we want to we want to figure out how to depopulate the planet. You know, it, it's with how do we create a sustainable life for all living here on this planet. And, and they're not talking about humans when they talk about all. They're talking about animals and trees. And, you know, uh, humans are usually in the bottom of the equation when it comes to creating the sustainable world where, you know, everything's, I don't know, it's just this, this uh, whole um, en enigma that, that, that they write stuff up in, in these grants and then people apply for them and it's all tax-free. So what are you going to get in the end? You get a steered movement, and people don't see it. It's been happening for generations. So, I mean, we've been dumbed down. We're part of that process because we're third, fourth generation in. Well, their world is one set of humans who are building this new world order system, mm -hmm. and then the rest of us who are either dumb sheep going along with their system, giving them power, or the useless eaters that they want to outright kill. But, of course, they're targeting all of us. Right. Yeah, another story we covered uh, was the transistor that was made the size of an atom. Um, I used to work at a, a semiconductor company not too far from here, and I, re I remember when they made the jump from uh, 200 millimeter uh, wafers, and, and, and a wafer, you know, is about this big, 200 millimeter, and they would put chips on it and cut them up. And they, when they went from 200 to 300, it was it was like we had landed on the moon almost. It was huge. Mm -hmm. It was this big breakthrough that was going to change everything, and now. You know, a 300 millimeter wafer, you could get, tr you know, trillions of little atom sized transistors on it. So that even breaks the mold of, of Moore's law, which is the way technology is supposed to double every 18 months. So, I mean, what is greater you think of acceleration? That? Right, right. Well, I haven't had time to look at this in detail, but yeah, it's exciting what they can do. But yeah. nanotechnology, which is mentioned in this article, has a lot of dangerous implications as well. And what why are all these elites in the computer world so into the Bilderberg Group and so into this right. depopulation agenda? It's not just Bill Gates. Yeah. It's the Hewlett Foundation, the Packard Foundation. They're into depopulation and eugenics. Uh, you know, you've got Bill Joy of Sun Microsystems, right? He was the one who wrote the article, Why the Future Doesn't Needing Us, uh, Doesn't Need Us, warning that he was at this elite tech conference and they were talking about that kind of age-old question of do they kill us outright or keep us as pets? Yeah. And that's our future. And <laughs> one of the big Apple CEOs, uh, Wozniak or whatever his name Wozniak. is, he was talking about the same thing, how our future as humans is basically as pets at best. It's, just, it's not a world I want to live in. But everyone's figuring it out. You could yeah. feel it at the speech last night. Yeah. Alex put on a show, but even more touching was all the questions. He took, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 people's questions and answered them. After mm -hmm. the sessions, they lined up on the wings, and uh, among other issues they brought up, a lot of good issues, people were talking about how they were diagnosed with this kind of disease and, and on death's bed, but then they found InfoWars and found natural news and started discovering uh, natural and, uh, I guess, homeopathic and vitamin-based cures for themselves and turned that disease around, got rid of the disease completely or, or at least fought back its effects 
One guy had yeah. MRS. His daughter had had diabetes type 1. They're trying to fight it. Another woman uh, had, I forgot what the condition was. She was on death's bed. Then she just removed aspartame for her diet, and even her doctor was shocked at how quickly uh, her symptoms faded away and how she was able to beat the disease she was facing. Well, she was probably drinking three cans of this stuff a day or, or a two-liter bottle every other day. And, you know, it, it's like I was listening to Ben Fuchs on the way in this morning, and, and he's like, you know, we're not curing diseases here. What we're doing with, with mineral supplements is creating a place where your body is so powerful, it can fight off these types of things. It will naturally heal itself. We're not curing anything. We're just creating the body, putting the body back to its its state that it was meant to be. But of course, in. it's not just the body, it's the mind. I mean, we That's have so it. many yeah. higher thought capabilities, but they're limited when we live in this narrow spectrum mm -hmm. and eat this diet that's just made to make us subjugated. And, you know, of course, I've been thinking more about that myself, but just you drive to Dallas and it's no wonder we're so inundated with this. I mean, not only TV, but right. the billboards like start your day with a Diet Coke. Go yeah. ahead and pour yourself a two liter of Coca-Cola. Go yeah. ahead. You earned it. And all these kind of like <laughs> motivating, you, you know, poison pushers, you the man, they're poison pushers. And, you know, it's disgusting what they do. And, you know, th this stuff, I don't think it needs to be regulated. I think people need to be educated into it. Because once you start regulating one thing, then it leads, you know, this long line where we have regulations on everything. People should be allowed to, to, to drink soda if they want to, but if it's killing them, they should also know about it. Well, I'm not, I'm for uh, arresting and prosecuting where there's crime. I'm not for banning the Council on Foreign Relations. There's still right. free speech even for the bad guys. Yeah. But I want their ideas to fall. Our ideas are better. And this awakening that's happening, you could feel it, you could see it. Uh, we want the transformation of greater ideas. That's what we need. And for people to just see that that whole thing's a farce and it's going to fall off on its own weight. Right. And that's the playing field we should all be talking about. We should be talking about, you know, how are we going to move, you know, our race forward? How are we going to explore space? How are we going to, you know, how are we going to, we could, we could feed all the people in the world if we really wanted to. Yeah. It wouldn't be that, it wouldn't, and, you know, we don't have to do it by killing people. We, well, we, I mean, economics 101 under Keynesian is how they destroy food to keep the market prices stable. Exactly and keep people employed in certain sectors. Alex talked or about the green speech energy. last night, too. Yeah. They pay farmers not to grow food. Right. And while that whole green revolution was all Rockefeller-funded, yep. all the that monoculturalism uh, really destroyed a lot of real agriculture, and, and rather than curing starvation, it's caused a lot of extra problems. Depleted the soils, it's uh, put a lot of pesticides out there, it created a lot of pesticides that didn't need to be created in the first place, we put them in the soil. that was a 30-40 that was a 30, 40 year phase, now sure. they're in phase two with yeah. the Gates and Rockefeller Foundation, that thing called Agra, that's the initial, mm -hmm. and that's where they're pushing the GMO crops on Africa, the drought oh, yeah. resistant stuff that they all, of course, have the patents on and stand to gain financially from. And if you don't want to, you know, get the seeds and plant their crops, well, here comes the thug squad, you know, with, with, the, with the machetes ready to take action. Yeah, against we had people yeah. lined up in the questions, too, who had been personally sued, or the guy's father had been by yeah. Monsanto, uh, because his crops were contaminated, and, and now he's in financial burden. Right. And, uh, it's amazing how they do the law. Um, I, I played a video earlier about what's going on with, uh, with me in Pittsburgh. I went up there and was trying to come up with a resolution to this, and, and the company, the, the insurance carrier, who is in charge, you know, they, they have representatives from the city and, and, and the police there, but they don't have any decision-making power. It's all down to this insurance company. And guess who's at the top of that pyramid? Hmm. AIG, well, that's nice. a company we built out and, and they're going, no, we're not gonna do anything. We don't really care about the First Amendment. We're not interested in talking with you. Um, you know, we're just gonna try and suck as much blood out of you as we possibly can. It was pretty, Pretty disgusting, but um, I, while I, Goldman Sachs buys collapse insurance on AIG and plays both sides to make a huge killing. There you go, and then why we also bail them out to the trillion, you know, billions of dollars, and uh, it's disgusting. Aaron, um, we're going to Orlando, and we're going to be there um, this next Sunday. And there's the website there. It's uh, Alex Jones' blue, blueprint to defeat the New World Order. Sunday, February 26, 7 p.m. Eastern, at the Orlando Highlight. I guess it's where they play that interesting sport with the giant hand I rackets. So, I've, yeah. never, I've never seen it live, but it looks pretty interesting. Um, so, yeah, there you can get your tickets um, at that website. You can go to infowars.com forward slash events, and that'll take you to the Highlight website down at the bottom, and you can get your tickets. Uh, I believe there's still a few seats left. Aaron, then they know, sell out? That's right. Dallas was a packed house, but, you know, it's really something to see Alex speak. He really hits his stride. It's one thing to hear him on the radio. That's inspirational, too. 
I've had a lot of personal kind of revelations watching Alex speak at these events over the years, and it really dawns on me that it's not just Alex talking in a vacuum. Like, people are responding to this stuff. You meet people at these events. You find out how much they know. In yeah. most cases, even more than I know or Alex knows or anything. I mean, people are awakening. You can feel that energy at these events, and you learn from it. You walk away with this greater sense of, like, you know, this really is happening, and you take action from there, and, and that in itself is part of the solution, really. Right. Well, it's definitely energizing people. I could tell. I've been to a couple of his live events, uh, especially I remember going to see uh, Road to Tyranny many years ago um, at the Alamo Draft House, and he got up. He didn't do a long speech, maybe like a five-minute speech, but it really energized the crowd. And then watching that film, especially the Oklahoma City footage, with a room full of people gasping all at the same time, like, mm -hmm. We never heard about a second and third bomb. Where is this information? But even more than all that stuff, because that's been covered, we know what's oh, going right. on with that stuff. I mean, Alex is really, in his speech last night, showing people that we do have the power, that we're already having these victories, mm -hmm. that we're already in the process of turning this around. We just have to get up out of our seats and activate and do this thing out yeah. there. We already have all the people, and yeah, it's one thing to be a listener and a follower of Alex, but to become an activist yourself and, and, and say, that's an issue I resonate with. I'm right. gonna go take action on this. If you're not into this issue, you don't wanna talk about 9-11, well, we know the truth anyway. Get out there and talk yeah. about the financial collapse. Get the out GMOs. there and talk about the GMOs. Yeah, that affects there's, everyone. There's plenty of stuff, fluoride in the water. I mean, we've had people, just by taking some of the stuff that we've put out, go and show it to their water boards or their councils, and boom, one vote, and it's out. I mean, it's just that easy. I don't know if people really understand how, you know, what's 80% of it's being there? You know, it's it's just being on the field, yeah. standing there. Uh, we played some clips earlier today on C-SPAN, this, this mouthpiece for the government sitting there talking about how he... He hadn't heard any of this information about Kurt Haskell and the underwear bomber. And caller after caller from all over the country, you know, started off in Austin, then it went to uh, Vermont, and then, yeah, I think it was in Florida, there was another one. And it, they just repeatedly pounded this guy, saying, look, all this information's out there. One guy was saying, I'm disabled, and I found out all this information. They had warehouses of these body scanners, and, you know, all they needed was that one event, and that was the underwear bomber. That was the event to start just putting these everywhere, which we're going to have to deal with uh, yeah, on Saturday. You and I were at an airport yeah. before the underwear bomber incident happened, and yeah. they tried to make us go through body scanners. Oh, yeah. So it was all a hoax, and these radiation machines are statistically killing at least 100 people a year. Meanwhile, the TSA has not caught one terrorist. They let the underwear bomber on the plane. Yeah. And so that's, that's what we get out of TSA and all this other tyranny. As they roll in these checkpoints, it's... People know what's going on, but yep. it's time to stand up and really say no and, and not give in to this stuff. It's disheartening to see this stuff, but it's great to know that we're out there fighting. There's other people out there who I've never even met who are fighting the fight that we're fighting. And, you know, it's all about truth, getting it out there. So thanks for coming out, Aaron. two cities, the worst of times, the best. There you go. There you go. Thanks, dude. And uh, that's all we have today for InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. If you're watching this on YouTube, please consider becoming a member. You can go to prisonplanet.tv or infowarsnews.com. And we have some great specials there. I think we have 14 days free still offered right now. So you can get on, try it out, see if you like it. And, uh, you know, it'll take you, take you there. We're, uh, we're doing this five days a week. Aaron's going to be hosting the next two nights. And then we got uh, Paul Joseph Watson and Darren McBreen's going to do his second uh, tour, I guess, on the show. So keep watching. Send us your suggestions. I throw out my email on there. I love hearing from you guys. It's, it's been it's been a great journey so far since I've been here um, in early 2009 is when I started working here. And but I, I was an info warrior long before that. So it doesn't. I don't. You know, if I wasn't working for Alex, I would still be out there shooting chemtrails and making videos and and trying to wake people up because that's what it's all about. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow night.